very good evening. Welcome to this evening's webinar on 2015, the role of technology in procurement. This webinar will be led by Eric Evans. Before we begin, I'd like to take you through a few important points. The slides will be available um, on our slide share page and we will email you a link containing the slides and the recording of the webinar within about a week after today. We will allocate time uh, for Eric to answer your questions at the end of the presentation so you can feel free to type out your questions in the chat box as they occur to you. Uh, also, there will be a post-webinar survey that will pop up at the end. Please do take the time to fill that out for us. Just to take you through a little uh, introduction to your presenter today, Eric Evans. Eric has been a senior uh, associate with us for our training courses, as well as a speaker on conferences across the region. Um, he's also an author and a management consultant, along with being a practitioner on supply chain and procurement. Um, so I'm going to pass, pass it over to Eric now to take over. I hope you enjoy the webinar. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for taking the time to attend this webinar. And I do hope that you get something of value out of the time that we're going to spend together. As Mega has said, we have the facility during this webinar for you to post questions to me on the website. And what we will do is wait until I finish the formal presentation before I respond to those particular questions. So please, at any stage during the next hour or so, please feel free to send some questions which we will deal with at the end of the presentation. You know, six or seven years ago we quite simply wouldn't have been able to do this. Um, six or seven years ago we would have been um, doing this by telephone or um, doing this in some other way, but the idea of a webinar or a video conference just didn't exist. And technology has changed that much, not just in terms of what we do with computers, but in terms of what we do with our everyday lives. I guess a few of you may already have cars which have self-parking capabilities, cars that will reverse into spaces for you. In the UK, there are three cities which are currently piloting driverless cars. And the idea is you sit in this vehicle and the car drives itself without any help or guidance from the people inside the car other than putting the address they're driving to into the sat nav. Um, can you imagine what's going to happen in five or six years time in terms of lorries, in terms of goods being delivered to customers, if this proves to be a successful trial? I'd like you to think also about five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago and how technology has changed the way that we conduct our personal lives. If you ever went to a bank to try and get cash out 10 years ago, you will have been conscious that everybody went to the bank at lunchtime and that the bank staff at lunchtime disappeared to have their own lunch. And so you spent most of your time queuing up to get out a couple of hundred dirham. Um, and today we all have hole in the wall cards and we get everything out uh, in terms of cash much more easily. If you ever hired a car in the USA or in Europe and pulled into a gas station to tank up, you'll have noticed that you don't have staff to tank your car up for you. You're expected to get out of the car and do it yourself. And these are the sort of changes that we've all seen in our personal lives. What I want to do for the rest of the webinar is focus on some of the changes that we're seeing in procurement through the use of IT. In particular, I'd like to spend some time looking at the transactional elements of procurement, the value-adding aspects of procurement, things like strategic sourcing, category management, forecasting, demand for inventory management, and then spend a little bit of time talking about the next 
five years and what we expect to happen in the next five years. I've also got a short case study where I want to take one company that's actually at the, the leading edge of technology and procurement and just share with you the sort of things that that company is currently doing before we look at the sort of things which they think they'll be doing in another four or five years time. Finally, we'll leave some, some time for questions and answers at the end of the session, but as I say, please feel free to drop your questions down now on the, uh, the webinar facilities. Let me start off with one of the, the, the things that we've uh, seen considerably change in recent years. Um, this is the very first purchase order that we've tracked down. It's uh, about three and a half thousand years old. It's based in this region. It's a purchase order for some, uh, some oil that was ordered by one buyer from a supplier. And I just wonder how long it actually took to put all of those characters onto the purchase order. Thank heavens we don't do that anymore. Um, we moved on from that. We, uh, we then went through a phase of using typewriters. Uh, for those of you who are quite young, you might wonder where you plug the typewriter in and where all the words come out, but um, thankfully we don't have typewriters anymore. This was one of the first computers. Can you imagine having this on your desk uh, and using this to send emails? This was only as far back as the 1970s, incidentally, so there's, there's nothing um, more than 30 or 40 years old in here, but thankfully now computers have changed. I wonder how many of you have an Apple computer that looks like this one. Um, again, we're talking about something that's relatively recent, and we're talking about something that has about the same computing power, or slightly less computing power, than the Apple Watch, which is actually being launched this week. We've got on to the tablet, um, and we're moving very, very quickly to this sort of technology that you see on James Bond films and films like The Matrix, where people wave their hands around um, to instruct the computer what to do. Um, this technology now is available on Samsung televisions, incidentally. You can change channel, change volume, set it to record, just by waving your hands at the TV screen. It's a lot different from 15, 20 years ago, and it makes you wonder just what the world is going to be like in other 50 or 20 years. One of my staff has actually recorded this as John's Law. What he's worked out is that something like every couple of years when he buys a new computer, the price of the computer stays roughly the same, but the, the power of that computer increases dramatically. What we've seen and will continue to see is the cost of computers come down year after year, and the processing power and the storage capacity increase. The 2042 element of this slide is, is a little bit science fiction, but when you start thinking about some of the things that we've seen like Google Glass and some of the in-ear computer processors which are now around, um, maybe this isn't too far away from reality. As well as seeing changes in the, the computers that we're using, we have this thing called cloud computing which is making a massive difference to us. Um, it means that organizations have much lower computer costs. It means people can access their data from literally anywhere in the world. Um, it means that staff can actually work from home quite easily. And one of my clients, IBM, actually has some staff who do their, their work from bed at home. Um, that means conference calls, that means computing, just by lying in bed of a morning. The major area that we're seeing benefits in procurement is in the area of transactional procurement. There was a newspaper article over the weekend in the British press which actually said that within 10 years, something like half of the administrative staff working in offices, including procurement, will actually lose their jobs quite simply because of the advances in technology. And transactional procurement is where a lot of this job loss will actually come from. Let me explain in a little bit more detail what I mean by that. If you think about what we do in procurement, we do things which are absolutely essential, such as processing paperwork, invoices, and so on. And we do things which add significant value 
to the organizations that we work with. Um, this is the transactional side of things. In the old days, people would write purchase requisitions, which would be sent through to somebody in the organization to approve. Then they'd be sent through to procurement. And after doing some sourcing work, getting competitive quotations and so on, somebody in procurement would actually place a purchase order. Eventually the goods would arrive and along with the goods would come an invoice which had to be processed. Somebody would have to match the invoice with the goods receipt notes and the purchase requisition and then if all went well, the invoice would be sent elsewhere in the organization for payment to be approved and eventually a check would be raised, printed off, posted and sent through to the supplier. And if you consider this whole cycle of procurement to pay, in organizations in the past, and it has to be said in many organizations today, you still have a considerable proportion of the procurement staff involved in this added cost transactional activity. Now all of this is absolutely essential, but the reality is this adds very little value to our organizations. What happens today is that e-commerce, e-procurement, technology has made all of this much easier for our staff to deal with. So for example, in terms of the start point on this cycle, requesting goods and services, many organizations now have electronic catalogs where the user, be that a nurse in a hospital ward or a a supervisor in a factory or somebody in a remote office somewhere else gets onto a computer and accesses an in-house electronic catalog and the catalog gives them an option of what it is they want to buy so if they type brush the computer says what type of brush hairbrush floor brush toothbrush clothes brush yard brush and the user types in what type of brush is the computer then asks a number of simple questions of the user and eventually the user pushes a simple button and the order is sent directly to the supplier without having to go to procurement. Now if the value of the order is great it may be that the electronic order is sent first of all to somebody to approve that request. In other words I don't have the authority to place this requisition without my boss or the budget holder approving that request. What happens in this case is a copy of the order still goes to the supplier but with a message saying this has not yet been approved but get ready. We would like delivery on this date and we would like you to get ready to deliver and as soon as the request has been approved we will send you a confirmation. All of this is done almost instantaneously. There's no need to handwrite the purchase requisition. There's no need to send it in the internal mail for your boss to approve. There's no need then to send it on to the procurement department. It's all done electronically. And the procurement department doesn't necessarily need to see a copy of this request, especially if the purchase requisition is calling something off from a contract that's already been agreed with suppliers. So the whole process has changed. Requesting goods and services, approving the request, placing the order, all of these things can be done with minimum manual intervention within procurement. Each of us needs to stop and think about how much resource within our procurement department we spend on these things. Each of us needs to think about if we could get that resource doing things which add value rather than process paperwork, what difference that would make to the value we bring to the organization. Each of us needs to think about if we can reduce the amount of transactional procurement that we actually do, what this would mean for the image of procurement within our organizations. It has to be said that in many organizations, procurement is still seen as a clerical or administrative function. In the 21st century, we have to consider using technology to change the way we do this type of work and to change the image that the organization has of, of us. Once the order has been sent, 
then accounts payable will get considerable benefits out of an e-procurement system. So these days, for many organizations, an invoice does not exist as a piece of paper. Suppliers will send electronic invoices into the organization, even if they're simply in a Microsoft Excel format, and the accounts payable system will translate that Excel spreadsheet or electronic invoice into something the computer can match and reconcile with the electronic purchase order and the electronic goods received note. If everything is fine, and I'll share with you some examples in a moment or two of organizations where 95% of invoices coming in are approved without being touched by anybody, then there is a massive saving for the accounts payable organization. And for many of us, paying suppliers has been an automated process for many years. Again, if you look back 10 or 15 years, we'd produce a check and post that check to a supplier. Whereas today, what we have is things like banks, banks, automated payment systems, and SWIFT, which is an interfunds transfer. Ladies and gentlemen, what we have is the potential now to take transactional procurement and get rid of it as a labor intensive activity in the same way that we've got rid of the need for bank staff to stand behind the counter and turn a, a written check into cash for each of us. The initial adopters of e-procurements, the initial adopters of e-commerce looked at this transactional procurement and saw significant benefits in this area. The idea of being able to scan barcodes, the idea of being able to uh, use email and to use uh, optical character recognition where computers can read documents has changed the face of administrative procurement. Where are the benefits coming from? The benefits come from a number of different sources. And I'm going to use the term e-procurement, which is the red box in the, the top left of this particular slide, just to explain how these benefits come. I'm looking at, on this slide at the, the total purchase to pay system, whereby procurement is involved in everything from understanding the requirements right through to making sure that the organization honors its obligations to suppliers by paying invoices. If we move from the e-procurement bubble to the transactional benefits bubble, consultants, software houses and practitioners will all tell you that the transactional benefits they have received from automating the clerical aspects of procurement are very, very significant. Evidence suggests that it has cost in the past up to $30 to process a purchase requisition, turn it into a purchase order, translate that into an invoice from the supplier, match the invoice with the goods received note in the purchase order, and then pay the supplier's invoice. And that $30 is partly procurement staff time, but more significantly is the time and cost of staff in accounts payable. The evidence is that replacing automated manual systems, I'm sorry, let me say that again, replacing paper-based transactional systems with automated transactional systems can see a reduction in cost from $30 per transaction to 30 cents. All you have to do, ladies and gentlemen, is consider the arithmetic. If you place a thousand orders in a year and you're saving something like $30 on purchase orders, can you imagine the savings that you're making in organizational cost? For many of us, we place an awful lot more purchase orders than a thousand in the course of a year. The savings are relatively um, clear to see. One of the other things that we're seeing in transactional benefits is increasing use of things like P cards or procurement cards. You know, if you think about the invoices that you get from a supplier, then very often 80% of the invoices that come into your accounts payable department are for less than $20 or $30.
And the cost of processing these invoices can be significantly higher than the value of the goods actually covered by the purchase orders. And so anything that we can do to reduce this cost must make sense for the organization. What we've seen for a few years now is organizations giving company credit cards, Amex cards or Barclay cards or Visa cards to budget holders and saying, please use these procurement cards, these P cards, for low value transactions. So if you want to order something from a supplier and the total cost is $20, $50, instead of raising the requisition, quite simply order it on your company procurement card. How does this save money? Instead of processing thousands of invoices in a month or a quarter or a year at $30 a time, you process one credit card statement per month from each procurement card holder. The procurement card holder will clearly need to check the monthly statement, but what happens then is there is one payment rather than thousands of payments covering these low value issues. The other benefit that we're seeing is improved compliance to contracts that have been negotiated by the procurement department. Let me explain how this works. If you have one of these electronic catalogues, it is incredibly easy for staff within your organization to log on to the computer system, log on to the electronic catalog, and find an item they require which is covered by a contract. Once they find the item, with just a few keystrokes, they are able to order the item directly from the supplier, safe in the knowledge that procurement have already negotiated the contracts. This changes the procurement focus from having to deal with individual purchase orders to having to deal with higher value contracts covering more of your requirements. And so we're able to reduce the number of suppliers that we deal with, we're able to provide framework contracts and thus allow our users within the organization to call off against these contracts directly. Clearly, once people call off against these contracts, the IT system keeps a record of the expenditure against these contracts. So how does this help with Maverick spend? If somebody wants to order something that is not covered by a procurement contract, something which is not on the e-catalog, there is quite a tedious and painful process where they have to justify buying from somebody other than an approved supplier on a contract that has been negotiated by procurement. I'll come on shortly to explain the sort of benefits that people have actually seen with this type of arrangement. But the bottom line is we are seeing a great deal of increased compliance with negotiated contracts and much less maverick spend with suppliers um, that procurement have not approved. All of this leads to a greater degree of management information within the organization. Without going too far from his desk and his computer, the buyer is absolutely able to access management information on spend, on contracts and how they're being used, on maverick spend, on which departments are not using the contracts, able to also access information on the supplier and whether the supplier is delivering on time, the extent to which the supplier is meeting specifications and approved quality, or the extent to which the supplier is causing problems. You know, if you go up to the, the lower prices box as well, what we're able to do is look at the total number of our suppliers and conduct optimization programs where we try to decide is it possible to reduce the number of suppliers by asking fewer, better suppliers to supply a wider range of goods and services. And of course, if we're able to get rid of 20% of our suppliers, and these are the 20% worst performing suppliers, then we're able to give our better suppliers 20% more business, which of course results in better prices. We're also able to give our suppliers the confidence 
that if we do a deal with them, there will be much less maverick buying and people turning around and buying things off contract. One of the other negotiating benefits of all of this is improved payment terms. I'll give you some examples in a few moments which show how the e-commerce process that we're talking about, the use of IT and procurement, allows us to pay our suppliers much more quickly. Please never underestimate the value of this when negotiating with a supplier. To be able to say we pay 80%, 90% of our suppliers exactly in line with our payment terms gives our suppliers the confidence that we will honor the cash flow obligations or the payment terms that we include within our contracts. And of course, as I said a few minutes ago, this actually makes sure that we have increased first time matching of invoices, goods received notes and purchase orders. All of this without staff. Now by and large, ladies and gentlemen, these are benefits which come from transactional procurement. And I'll just give you a, a, a case study, if I may, just to show you the sort of benefits that one real company has got out of this before we talk about the more added value aspects of IT and procurement. This is an example from a, a company called GlaxoSmithKline, and I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard of GlaxoSmithKline. It's one of the world's largest and most successful organizations. It's essentially a pharmaceutical organization, but they also produce uh, a number of consumer goods products. Um, largely, things like Ribena, um, soft drinks, baby foods, and so on. GlaxoSmithKline, a number of years ago, contacted Ariba, which is part of SAP, or SAP, one of the world's largest IT systems companies, and explored what technology could do within procurement and accounts payable within GlaxoSmithKline. This particular slide focuses very much on the accounts payable side of things as part of the purchase to pay process. And in a little while, I'll share with you some of the benefits that the sourcing element of procurement have seen. But the numbers here at the bottom of this slide speak for themselves. Within one year, of asking suppliers not to submit paper invoices, but to submit electronic invoices, GlaxoSmithKline were able to say the cost of processing an invoice came down from four and a half dollars per invoice to something like one one dollar seventy, roughly. That's a saving of roughly three dollars per invoice. Give some thought to the number of invoices that your accounts payable department receive in the course of the year and multiply that by $3 to get a feel for the savings which this system has the potential to deliver. If you've got 100,000 invoices coming in in the course of a year and you actually turn around and save $3 on each, that's quite a significant save. This next point is, is maybe a, a difficult point to explain, but a 90% reduction in the time to receive invoices. Uh, a lot of people turn around and say, how is that a benefit for the organization? There's two issues on this one. One is increasingly in certain parts of the world, North America and Western Europe, for example, there is a, a move to try and ensure that suppliers are paid promptly. The reality behind this is that suppliers go bankrupt, not because of any lack of profitability, but they go bankrupt because of cash flow issues. And one of the big issues in cash flow is how long it takes a customer to pay its suppliers. What GlaxoSmithKline have done is set themselves a target, which is we want to be able to pay something like 96% of our invoices within the time specified on the contract. And that is something like 30 or 45 days, depending on the supplier, from receipt of goods. To actually reduce the amount of time it takes to receive the invoice means that GlaxoSmithKline are able to pay their suppliers something like three weeks quicker, which does wonders for the supplier's cash flow. It puts GlaxoSmithKline in a, a stronger negotiating position because what they're saying is we can probably pay you three weeks more quickly. Now, what are the benefits you will offer us 
in return. The savings also include savings on manpower. So what we have here is something like 85% of invoices come in from suppliers are matched and paid without being touched by anybody in procurement or accounts payable. It's a complete electronic process. Electronic invoice, electronic matching, electronic approval, electronic payment. And the only time accounts payable or procurement get involved is if there is any mismatch between, for example, the price on the invoice and the price on the contract or the purchase order or the quantity that's involved on the goods received note. The more we can do to reduce the number of queries, the more we can focus our people on added value activities rather than on the things which add to cost but don't necessarily add to value. So ladies and gentlemen, one of the things I said a few moments ago was that the, the early benefits that we're seeing from increased use of IT and procurement have been to reduce transactional costs and to make us more efficient in terms of our transactional activities. However, there's an even bigger benefit which comes from looking at strategic sourcing and the way we engage with suppliers. The less time that we have to spend on transactional activities, the more time our people have to spend on strategic sourcing. And it's interesting that in organizations like GlaxoSmithKline, although they have reduced the amount of time spent on transactional activity, they have not reduced the size of the procurement department. What has happened instead is the procurement staff have focused much more strongly on strategic sourcing the things that add value to the organization. So in GlaxoSmithKline for many years now, the use of technology has given them the resources which they would otherwise have been denied as management said you cannot increase headcount. So GlaxoSmithKline have increased the headcount on sourcing by reducing the requirements to do transactional activities. And this ladies and gentlemen is no more than one of the strategic sourcing models that you see in organizations today. It takes the transactional activities and strips them out and says these are the things we would really like our procurement guys to focus on. So forgive me if I go through some of these eight bubbles from stakeholder engagement, analysis, sourcing and so on and just explain how the IT function is now able to support us as we actually do this. Stakeholder engagement, procurement become much more able to interact with people. If you're working across multiple geographical locations, if you're working in different time zones, the use of things like webinars, the use of things like conference calls, the use of things like Skype or FaceTime, the use of video conference means it's much easier to engage with people. The, the reality is we're much more able to access real data and share factual information with stakeholders um, than we ever have been in the past. Analysis, an example with IBM I will give you shortly, shows how IBM are able to use simple tools like Google to do things like data mining and to actually provide much more comprehensive analysis of supply markets than their people have ever been able to do in the past. Increasingly, procurement is being expected not to handle requisitions and turn them into purchase orders. Increasingly, Procurement is being asked to analyze market data, supplier data, to look at demand, to do forecasting, to think about total cost of ownership rather than price, to think about the business case associated with changing from one supplier or one product or one technology to another. And this is where we make ourselves much more strategically important to an organization rather than dealing with pieces of paper called requisitions. In terms of things like sourcing strategy and going to market, what we're seeing is companies in this region like Tajari do things like reverse auctions or e-auctions, where instead of sending out RFPs and RFQs, we hold an auction online and we ask suppliers to bid online. 
in an environment where each of them can see the prices that their competitors have actually quoted. You know, the evidence on something like this is that companies like GlaxoSmithKline have reduced their prices by 25%, in some cases 37%, and in one particular case 74%. Just by holding an auction online, where they go out to a number of suppliers electronically and ask the suppliers to bid online, and the buyers can sit there, and the suppliers can sit there and watch the prices drop over a period of time. Within GlaxoSmithKline, within organizations I've had the pleasure of working with, like British American Tobacco, Diageo, Unilever, Procter & Gamble, it has not been difficult to produce 35, 37% savings on an item by holding a reverse auction. I would love you to imagine what it's like to go back to a chief executive and tell him that you've just taken an item that you spend a lot of money on and you've just reduced the price by 37%. It's one of those moments in life where you feel good and the chief executive feels good and all of a sudden the value of procurement in that organization rises. So e-auctions is one of the easy ways of generating benefits for the organization out of increased use of, of IT. But it's not the only benefit that we get. Um, there are benefits that come from contracts. Let me explain. It's often very, very difficult for a buyer to access some of the contracts that have been placed with particular suppliers or with different suppliers for a particular item in one location, let alone in multiple locations. But some of the work that we've done recently with a pharmaceutical company in the Emirates has led to uh, a contract database being established within the regional team's offices. What this actually means is that any buyer anywhere within the region who's looking, for example, at a particular packaging item can find out what his colleagues within the business has done in terms of contracts, contract terms and conditions, contract clauses and prices and all of this is done at the touch of a button. The power this gives the buyer in negotiations is stunning. To be able to sit down with the supplier and say but one of your competitors has already agreed to this in another part of our business or you already agreed this in another part of our business. You personally may not have agreed this point Mr. Supplier but one of your colleagues has. To be able to negotiate with this information really puts a buyer in a position of strength. And as we go around this to supplier management, to actually be able to capture information on supplier performance, to be actually able to talk about the, the number of deliveries where there has been a quality problem, or the number of deliveries which have come in late, and to use the facts to negotiate with the supplier really changes the balance of power when trying to deal with these issues. You know, in the past, what we've seen is suppliers have much more information on customers than the other way around. Today, we're seeing that balance redressed. We're seeing customers have much more power than their suppliers. And let me again just share one real example with you, if I may. Um, this is a, an example from Latin America. Um, this is an example from one of the largest hotel chains in Latin America. It's a, a hotel chain called Grupo Posadas, who got something like 120 hotels across the region. And the procurement guys had a challenge. And the challenge was in every hotel, everywhere in Latin America, there was a local buyer who wanted to do his own sourcing. There was a local guy who turned around and said, I can get a better deal than our group procurement people can. By putting in, again this happened to be an Ariba um, solution, but an Ariba sourcing solution, a category management solution, a catalogue management solution and procurement to pay, group procurement were able to get much more visibility of where the money was being spent. And so two things happened. First of all, the group was able to increase 
the amount of spend within these 120 hotels by something like 25%. This doesn't sound much, but this is increasing the power and the credibility and the value of procurement to the organization. And the procurement organization also saved a massive 18% by having better control over what was being spent within the organization. Every time somebody in a local hotel turned around and said, we've got a better deal, we can do this better locally, the procurement guys were aware of this. So nothing went under the radar. Nothing was invisible to the group procurement guys. And there were two conversations possible. One, a conversation which said, if we do not capture all of your spend, then everybody else within the group loses because this contract is supposed to give the supplier our total spend. And the other conversation is, if you have found a supplier who can do a better deal for just one hotel, then we need to go back to the group supplier we've negotiated with and see if that deal needs to be improved. But you know, the buyer has access to all of the information within the group on spend, on when contracts are up for renewal, on the quotations, on the bids received locally, and this has made a stunning difference to the sourcing within this hotel chain. Guys, it's not just um, some of the, the sourcing issues that give benefits. One of the things that increased IT has done for all of us is made our life in procurement a lot easier when we need to forecast demand and forecast the amount of items that suppliers should deliver in a way which allows us to reduce the amount of stock that we carry, but at the same time improve the service levels that we give to our budget holders and to our stakeholders within the organization. Forecasting is one of the areas that has really, really benefited from having cheaper computing, much more computing power, greater complexity and capability within the software that we actually use. And you know, even, even today, we talk to a number of organizations on very advanced industries, consumer goods, pharmaceutical, and so on, and we talk to them about how they forecast. And you still come across organizations where forecasting is just a question of looking at what we did last month and then working out what we think we're going to need next month. And when you look at the forecast accuracy of doing things that way, sometimes the forecast accuracy is only 50 or 60 percent. And of course the worry is if we run out of material, then our organization runs out of material, and this may impact upon our production department, or it may impact upon our ability to service customers. So what many of the organizations that we're dealing with today still do is carry excess stocks just as a way of dealing with forecasting inadequacies. And you know, not only is it a question of actually working out how can we make better forecasts, these days there are so many different statistical techniques which we could use for forecasting. And the slide that I put up on the screen shows 12 different forecasting techniques. Now four of them are qualitative methods things like the Delphi method, the jury of executive opinion, and so on. And these are typically forecasting methods when we have no data. So they typically apply when we're talking about forecasting demand for new products. Um, if you can imagine Apple, somebody in Apple has had the, the difficult task of forecasting how many of these Apple iWatches are going to be sold in the next three months, and how many stock SKUs we need to place orders with with suppliers and how many physical items within each of these SKUs we need to deliver. But park those qualitative methods. We then have eight individual forecasting methods that we can use. We can quite simply do a moving average and look maybe over the last three or four months at the trend and work out if there's an average Maybe what we need to do is extrapolate the average for the demand forecast for next month. There are slightly more sophisticated techniques like exponential smoothing, 
where we look at how accurate last month's forecast was and adjust the forecast for next month by factoring in the forecast error. Some of the things that we buy, there are seasonality trends or some of the things that we buy, we have distribution channels, different distribution channels that we need to focus on. Some of the things that we buy, maybe it's not simply a question of looking at the trend, but maybe the demand for a particular item is linked inextricably to something else. For example, the sale of, of ice cream and Coca-Cola in the UK is very much linked to the weather. As temperatures rise, people buy more ice cream. As temperatures fall, people buy less ice cream. And so looking at last month's sales of ice cream may not really help you at all. There's a thing called multiple regression where sometimes the demand for an item is based on a number of factors, not just one factor. And at the bottom, there's two abbreviations there, ARIMA and UCM, where there's a sign saying danger, deep water. Let me explain. Computing power has increased. Computer storage has increased. The cost of processing has decreased. And so the sophistication of forecasting tools has increased almost exponentially in recent years. And ARIMA and UCM are very complex ways of forecasting demand, which are quite simply not possible without a computer program. And you know, one of the things which computers and IT allow us to do these days is not just to do more accurate forecasting much more easily. We can get a spreadsheet to do the forecasting in a fraction of a second. But the computers these days can actually tell us of these eight time series and causal methods of forecasting, this one approach will give us greater accuracy. So for example, let me just share with you one um, screenshot from a particular forecasting system. I have to say that, that I'm, I'm not particularly pushing this one particular piece of forecasting software. This comes from a, a piece of software called Forecast Pro, and it's a very simple piece of software. You can actually just import to this software Microsoft Excel spreadsheets, or you can import data from SAP, SAP, or from Oracle, or JT Edwards, and then this piece of software will do a number of things for you. For example, what you have here is up to this line coming down, you have in green the history. Now you can see here there's a trend. You can see there are bits where the, uh, the green line is low, where perhaps the consumption is low, and then you have bits where the green line is higher, showing some evidence of seasonality. What this particular piece of software does is say, let's measure the trend, let's measure the history, and let's take the trend into account when we're forecasting the future here. So this red line is the forecast. It's actually able to forecast not just one month ahead, but a year ahead and possibly even longer, although you have to be clear that the further ahead you forecast, the more difficult it is for the software to be accurate. And ladies and gentlemen, I apologize, but I just want to point, point out there's a couple of lines here which you'll be able to read much better if you get a hard copy of this presentation. But this is where the computer says, we've looked at half a dozen different ways of forecasting to find out which is the most accurate. And we actually recommend this particular way of forecasting. In this case, it says exponential smoothing, because when we've applied exponential smoothing to the history, we found there has been a, a lower forecast error with exponential smoothing. Guys, it's not my job to sell a particular piece of software here, but people like Forecast Pro have developed some very powerful software tools which make our life in procurement much easier when we have to forecast demand. And this next slide again just shows you some of the other things that you can do. 
the, the program is able to actually conf calculate confidence levels. So it's able to say this is the forecast and the forecast is 80% accurate or 40% accurate or 95% accurate and it can give you a confidence level. The software program is able to look at the extent to which people have manually intervened in the program. So for example when a sales team says this is what we think we will sell and the manufacturing department say we're going to manually change that forecast, this program will actually say, do you know what, 90% of the time when manufacturing change the forecast, they make it worse or they make it better. And that gives you the ability to look at the, the forecast value add, the extent to which management or stakeholders within the organization add value by changing the forecast. Guys, this is just a summary slide. It, it's a, a snapshot from this organization, Forecast Pro. But you know, the only reason software programs like Forecast Pro are able to add value is because computing power is so much more powerful these days and can do so much more for us. In the 10 minutes we've got left, let me just go through just a few more slides before I take any questions you guys may have. You know, IBM are in the technology industry and this slide actually shows some of the things, just some of the things that they actually do these days with technology. So the chevrons in blue actually show some of their procurement process. Market intelligence, source selection, contracts and negotiation, catalogues, forecasting and so on. On market intelligence, one of the things that we've seen in recent years is an increase in the number of suppliers who go bankrupt. The buyers within IBM have automated links into companies like Dun & Bradstreet, which can actually tell you what your supplier's profitability and cash flow look like. This is not necessarily just looking at historical accounts from your suppliers, but it's looking at credit ratings from some things like banks and even pension funds. The software IBM use is actually able to get onto Google and give you a complete profile of suppliers. So what's their manufacturing capacity? How busy are they? What's their manufacturing footprint? Which customers do they use? What contracts have they won? What contracts have they lost? And there's a thing called Z scores. If any of you have any involvement in finance, you will be aware that a Z score is a, a formula that you can use to calculate the possibility or the probability that any particular supplier will go bankrupt within the coming three, six, nine, twelve months. And there's a lot of evidence that these Z scores are remarkably accurate. IBM buyers have access to this automatically just with a few keystrokes. Before doing business with a supplier, they can get their history, they can get market intelligence, they can look at the extent to which the Z-score predicts a supplier may have particular financial problems. On auto bid cycles, the stock control system will automatically go beyond flagging up that we need to get suppliers to bid for a new contract. The system will automatically send RFQs to suppliers and ask them to bid. The system will then automatically evaluate the bids from the suppliers and make a recommendation to the buyer. The buyer gets emails from the system actually telling him what's going on, so he has a right to, to get involved manually. And the buyers can actually access bid history from all of the suppliers at the touch of a button. In contracts, they can access any contract anywhere within IBM with any supplier, including the contract terms, um, contract changes, price history and so on. There are buyerless options for the catalogs, so requisitions go straight to suppliers and so on and so on and so on. And I'd love you to think just for a moment around what this means for a buyer. This means a buyer is much less of a clerk or an administrator and much more able to add value. 
Ladies and gentlemen, in the time I've got left, I'll maybe just show you two more slides. You know, the idea of a, a driverless car is something which, which fills my mother and my father with fear. They sit there and think of the idea of getting in a car, and then this car with no driver suddenly appears somewhere and causes an accident. And my kids, on the other hand, don't look at driver cars, driverless cars as something to be afraid of. They look as, as though new technology is something to, to recommend. It's something to look forward to. The pace of technology is changing faster and faster and faster. If you look at this slide today, things on the horizon today, the, the column-headed innovation trigger shows maybe 20 things that are people are currently thinking about today which are going to make massive changes to the way we do business. The peak of inflated expectations and the trough of disillusionment kind of says there's often a lot of hype about these things and that people's expectations come down. But then you have this thing called the slope of enlightenment and you have this thing called the plateau of productivity. And what this is suggesting is that even today there are things changing. The forecasts are we're not going to be typing for too many years now. Things like voice dictation systems are already very, very powerful. You can dictate a report, a purchase requisition, an email without a keyboard. And the data accuracy of these things is improving. You look at things like Skype or FaceTime. You look at these things like RFID, radio frequency identification chips, where you can put a small microchip into a component that's being delivered from a supplier. And there's one company in America who are talking about inserting these RFI chips into the necks of their staff so they can track where their staff are. Um, so people don't need to clock on and clock out of the morning. You look at e-auctions, you look at procurement to pay, you look at the ability to analyze data, data analytics. The changes that are coming have got some tremendous potential for procurement. Ladies and gentlemen, the, the, the last slide I want to share with you it is really a bit of a crystal ball slide, just kind of showing you the sort of things which people are talking about today, which are going to come in the not too distant future. This slide has been put together based on conversations with some of the, uh, the, the gurus in this field of, of IT who are talking about trends which are evident today. They're based on looking at the increasingly low cost of computing and thinking about what's now possible that wasn't possible a few years ago. You know, the, the, the average car today has more computing power than the first spaceship that took man up into space. It's quite a sobering thought, isn't it, when you think about the first astronauts and the, the poor computing skills that we had in those days and what we've got possible today. We have this thing called cloud storage and the latest buzzword is this thing called the Internet of Everything. We're using Wi-Fi, you can link in with your refrigerator at home, which will automatically tell Carrefour or your grocer that you need to order milk or butter and can they deliver some. It will turn the air conditioning on or off. It will turn the lights off while you're on holiday. You can access video cameras on your home while you're away to make sure your, your, your pets or, or there's no burglars in the house. Um, and there's been a lot of white papers around this sort of thing from companies like IBM and Gartner and CSC. The sort of benefits people are saying, we're going to see the sort of changes. Procurement as a science, based much more on the ability to analyze data, analyze the market, analyze particular suppliers, analyze trends, analyze history, something which is really going to move procurement to a new level we're going to be able to do the sort of analytics that market research guys have been able to do for years. Things like Skype and FaceTime, the ability to use video cameras, mobile phones, to actually tour factories mean we'll be able to not just hold conference calls with suppliers, but actually go and visit their factories just by somebody walking around the factory with a camera or the sort of Google Glass that people were talking about until recently. We're going to get computers making more and more decisions for us, not just on procurement, but auto buy systems. We're going to get RFID. We're going to find that 
stores departments don't need to update records because what will happen is we'll have things like the, the point of sale scanners that we have in grocers these days where people scan barcodes and stock records and reorder records are updated almost automatically. We're seeing stronger biometrics which mean that in a few years time hacking computer systems is likely to be a thing of the past. We're told that the end of the keyboard is coming and the desktop computer will, buy, will die as we move to laptops and tablets and wearable computers. We see more and more data sharing across the supply chain and that means that we can collaborate with suppliers on forecasting and minimizing stock. We can see the paperless office which people have been talking about for a while and risk in the technology process is actually going to come down. You know, if you think about holding a webinar, this webinar for the last hour has been absolutely dependent upon technology. And all it needs is a power cut or a, a hiccup somewhere. And we've got some very in, embarrassed people here in Informa and some very frustrated people out there on the other end of this webinar. Um, but what we're seeing is technology actually becoming foolproof. Technology actually doing things for us. Technology actually diagnosing things before they're going wrong and making sure that we have an idiot-based system. Ladies and gentlemen, in an hour it's very difficult to do justice to this subject. We have a course with an informer called Best Practice Procurement and we devote a, a half day, three hours, three or four hours just to looking at this particular topic. Um, but I do hope that this has been something that's made you stop and think about your own organisation and I'd be absolutely delighted to, to answer any questions you guys may have. Um, is there any questions? Hi, I, 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 can, I can see uh, a number of comments. I can see hello from Mr. Mohammed Zoheb. Mr. Mohammed, good afternoon. I hope you're keeping well. I can see hi from Mr. Adnan Jamil. And Adnan's also asked two questions. So the first question is that you work as a procurement specialist with an auto distributor in Dubai. I think the good news or the bad news for you, Mr. Adnan, is the automotive industry is very much at the forefront of um, IT within procurement. It's largely being driven by people like Toyota, people like Nissan, people like General Motors and Ford, where what they're doing is trying to automate as much as they possibly can. And if you remember that this is the industry where um, years ago they got rid of staff and now their cars are built by robots, by automated processes rather than by staff. And the role of the staff is really just to make sure that the, the robots um, are actually working effectively. I think what we're seeing within the automotive industry is people embracing these new IT tools and techniques much more quickly as a way of switching the, the non-added value staff in procurement away from um, transactional stuff into the strategic sourcing. The second question Mr. Adnan asked is that um, are there any methods for comparison of goods or services? There are some very specialized websites out there um, where what you're able to do is to tap into um, market intelligence websites which will give you, for example, competitive market prices. So if I give you a couple of examples. There is a company in the IT industry called Gartner. And Gartner have a service where we can access the Gartner website and the Gartner database and they will tell you, for example, things like SAP pricing or Microsoft pricing. This is the database that they've seen of prices around the world. Um, so they will tell you, for example, that uh, in North America, the cost of Microsoft Office is something like 19 or 20 percent higher than the cost of the same product in somewhere like Southeast Asia. Um, and again, there's a fee for something like this, but it is giving you access to market information, which perhaps hasn't been there in the past. There is also the ability to network 
in a way which hasn't been there in the past. So, for example, about, gosh, five, ten years ago now, the automotive industry set up what was known as a portal called Covisint, C-O-V-I-S-I-N-T. And this was effectively a club which was owned and operated by all of the major car manufacturing companies, the Toyotas, the General Motors, the Chryslers of this world. And the intention was to push all of their transactions with all of their suppliers through this electronic portal. Of course, the other thing this does, it means the electronic portal captures information on the prices from each of the suppliers and provides the ability to share this information from one supplier to another. So in other words, Ford were able to find out what General Motors were paying and Toyota were able to find out what Rolls-Royce were paying and so on. Now, Covisint has ceased to exist, but some of these automotive giants have actually retained the ability to share information across the different countries and the different companies. Now, some of this is bound by confidentiality clauses within the contract. So, for example, if a supplier has a confidentiality clause which prevents Ford sharing information with anybody else, then clearly can't, Ford can't share the information. But in the absence of that confidentiality clause, then sometimes you will find that the data that Ford have is shared with others within the industry. And there are, as I'm sure you know, very strong links anyway. So organizations like Nissan and Renault and Peugeot already cooperate a great deal. The Ford family includes very strong links with Mazda and Volvo and various other organizations. So again, an awful lot of data is shared, but the technology is an enabler and makes all of these things possible. Guys, I hope you've answered, I've answered those questions. Um, if you have no more questions, but you would like to get in touch, then please, when Mega sends out the, uh, the copy of the information, please send the question back via Mega, and Mega will share that question with me, and I'll do my best to get back to you and answer any questions that you have. Can I thank you for taking the time to listen, and wish you every success in the future. Thank you.